Kamu dari botoran dulu lah. Dasar Oh, itu Oh, itu Oh, itu Hello, good morning everyone. I hope that you all are in good condition and uh, always great as uh, always. So today uh, we will again have Dr. Noel with us. <clears throat> he will deliver a uh, lecture about polymer technology. So I guess Dr. Noel has already been here. Okay, so I think um, the same. If you have any question, you can. I and I hope actually you can ask him directly instead of uh, writing in the chat comment in the comment section. So I think it's better to ask him directly. Uh, and 
if you have some comments last uh, meeting, you can also uh, deliver your comments today. Okay, uh, I guess Dr. Noel has already been here. So Dr. Noel, time is yours. Okay. Hey, thank you very much, Dr. Hangara, for that introduction. Yes, this is my second lecture of the polymer processing technology of which I am tasked to do two lectures in series on the processing of polymer uh, uh, applications as well. Um, in, in, our, in, in our elective course here in University of San Carlos, we also have this course and uh, we also go through the uh, main topic of the polymer processing and polymerization courses. So I wish, I hope you have done that uh, in your class as well. And the processing technology uh, in this lecture will be focused on extrusion. So the last lecture I had uh, talked about the fiber spinning technology and the fiber spinning technology that I talked was more on a topic related to my research, which is solution blow spinning, which is uh, has been emerging technology on making nanofiber membranes and in application for masks as well as uh, membrane separations. Today, my lecture is about extrusion. So extrusion is one of the most famous, if not the most common type of polymerization industrially and academically. And to be honest, I have not been in an uh, industrial uh, polymer technology where extrusion has been done in big machines. So lectures here are based on what we have read and what we have experienced through my, what I have experienced in my lectures, especially on the science, for example, and then examples and applications. So that's it. And I would like to uh, share my screen. Okay. Okay. Oh, who can share? So should I change my, okay, my option, right? Sharing is, okay. I, I don't think I can share my screen yet. <laughs> Maybe someone has to. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh? Okay, maybe I will make you as a host. Okay, thank you, Dr. Angara. Okay, let's try it. Oh. Interesting. It doesn't give me the option to uh, share my screen. Share screen and screen options. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. It doesn't give me um, a, a window to share my screen. It, it just gives me a video on advanced sharing options. <laughs> and then there is a window that asks question who can share, then who can start sharing when someone is sharing. Okay, so... Or, 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 let's see. But uh, yeah, it is a little bit strange because you are already the host. Hmm. Like because when this... I, it's supposed to be, I'll click the share screen, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so if could, I you, it, could you find this? Yeah. But anyway, you can see the share screen. Uh, button right or yeah if i click it it gives me a, a a a box with two questions like who can share and who can start sharing instead of like yeah. getting into my file to uh, input my script my my destination of my yeah yeah, yeah. a window or yeah uh, a little bit strange i never experienced this 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 kind of uh, even so if someone have any information you can you can pass to us also or maybe i can uh, send you my uh yeah presentation <laughs> better yeah <laughs> send you my presentation then so that i can go straight to that
funny. We always have a problem with this. <laughs> yeah, I also, I also never had a smooth uh, lecturing. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I just sent it to you, Dr. Hangara. Let me try it again. Yeah, it doesn't just oh, yeah. quite strange. Okay, I will open that. Uh, wait a minute. Problem. Yeah, I'm opening the file. So as you said that you also have polymer something like polymer technology course, right? So what what is uh, what are the uh, topics that you that this course cover? I think we have the same course covered in your uh, syllabus as well. But oh, I think okay. yeah, the step polymerization, the cationic and ionic polymerization, those type of polymerization, and then we also have. Uh, uh polymerization in terms of reactor design because we that's the focus as chemical engineers so what type of reactors are suitable for batch polymerization something like that and then the polymer the polymer processing are is the same like yours like extrusion spinning uh the molding those kind of things and then we also have the emerging biopolymers so those are the uh, yeah. main uh, content of our course. Okay, can, uh, can you make me as a host again? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so that I can share. Uh, okay. So there should always be one, just one host in Zoom, right? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with this. This is just strange to me. Maybe I should learn more about hosting of so Zoom. Yeah, yeah, we are quite all the generation. <laughs> okay, uh, let me. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. There, maybe you can present it. 
So again, good morning and thank you for this opportunity. Um, um, I hope uh, uh, you can have time for question and answers later because I, I think I should leave by 11 a.m. My 11 a.m., that's your 10 a.m. Okay, so for this topic, uh, uh, can you go to the next slide, doctor? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, just show the whole slide, I guess, uh, the whole content. Uh, yeah, so the content of this uh, presentation is more on the extrusion, but the basic ones, because this is our first view of the topic on extrusion. So I'll try to define what is extrusion in the general sense in the context of polymer processing, as well as the different uh, processes that in, it involves, or what are the steps involves in that is involved in extrusion as well as the types of extrusion that have been used in different uh, industries. From there, oops, uh, from there I can also discuss some of the basic and uh, parameters that are critical for the design of the extruders as well as lastly on the advantages and the disadvantages. So some of the slides or each part of the types of extrusion has its own uh, product uh, application as well that I will be exposing to you. Okay, next slide. So this is the uh, definition of extrusion. In many ways, it is uh, a high volume processing that means it can uh, it can process uh, a big bulk uh, type of polymers or amount of polymers at the same time because this is a continuous process. You know, we have a batch, we have a continuous process, we have even have a semi-batch, but extrusion is a continuous process. So extrusion is the act actually of shaping a material by forcing it to a dye or through a dye or uh, other word for dye is a mold. So in any polymer, can I use? Okay. So in any polymer processing course, extruders are actually the most common equipment. So if we talk about polymerization or polymer processing technology, extrusion should be there because this has been a topic for more than decades or um, in, in many of the books. So the figure below depicts a typical extruder machine that converts solid polymers or pellets to a melt delivered to a dye or a mold. So the polymeric materials are actually fed in a hopper and it goes down on the bottom of the barrel where the screw is, is also located and the screw delivers the solid polymers into another zone uh, in which it starts to melt. And then when it's fully melted, it goes near to the dye and from the dye, it goes to the mold. So this is the product comes on the right side. So as what I mentioned, the polymeric material is in the form of pellets and are fed into the extruder hopper. And then it, it goes to the screw channel. The screw is actually driven by a motor through the gear reducer over here on your left side, rotates in a hardened barrel. So the barrel is actually this part, is actually the enclosure or the casing of the screw where a thrust bearing absorbs the rearward thrust of the screw and then thermal energy is actually uh, supplied by either during the melting process of the polymer or it can be internally uh, supplied. So there are heaters on top, uh, actually the bottom as well as the bottom of the barrel. And sometimes the, you don't have to put uh, heaters as well because there's what you call as cold extrusion as well. So sometimes it is both, there is a, a heater, sometimes it turns off and then heat it again. So it depends on the type of extrusion product that you want to uh, develop. And most of the time after molding or after dyeing, your product goes out here and then there is actually cooling as well. So uh, for a strict definition of the screw or the extrusion, there are, uh, there are three, three sections uh, for this uh, extrusion. So uh, let's, let's try to uh, discuss that further. Let's go to the next slide. So these are the three extrusion zones, what we call them regimes. You know, uh, once the product or the pellets, not the product, but the solid uh, polymer pellets are dropped into the feed zone, we call them, there is a solid zone. That means all things that are dropped are still in solid form or the pellet forms. 
that's where also the, the section where pellets are conveyed to the main segment. So the main segment here is um, the transitioning zone, or there are many terms here, we call it a plastic, plasticating zone, plastization zone, because it's where the transition occurs from the solid pellets to the liquid form. But it's not to the liquid all throughout, it is a transition form, but I'll discuss more about this later. And then it goes to the metering zone. The metering zone is where a section is fully melted or the hot melt is located. So the first zone, again, I'll try to explain a little bit, is where the polymer materials are conveyed to the main segment of the extruder. It is essential that the conveying capacity is equal to the extruder's uh, melting and pumping capacity. So the theoretical approaches for this zone are not well defined, um, but uh, instead a semi-empirical uh, approach is used that considers the pellets to behave such as a solid plug for the plug flow. Uh, this plug advances with little deformation, so that means uh, they're all the the, they're, the 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 morphologies of the plastic are preserved, and its rate of movement depends on both the back pressure in the extruder and the frictional forces of the screw of the flight and the barrel. Uh, can we go to, not next slide, but uh, next, yeah, so, okay. So you can see that in the barrel, the barrel is the outside coating, right? So this is the outside post coating and inside is the screw. So there is actually a distance between uh, the, the barrel and the, uh, and the flight of the screw. So the flight of the screw are these uh, horizontal or diagonally arranged metal. So there is a very small um, distance, right? And it has to have distance because of course, if it's, it's, it's close enough, you can create a lot of friction. It might be heated, then it will tear your barrel. It doesn't have to be so large as well because there might be leakage of your polymer material. So the transition zone, which is the second zone, is actually this, uh, the entrance of the solid zone to the entrance of the metering zone. It's where this zone connects the feed and the metering zone or the hot nut zone. So the length of this zone varies with materials being extruded and generally the flow channel cross section is reduced in this zone. An exception is for rubbery materials for which the pitch angle is changed so that the overworking can be avoided. And then the treatment of this zone requires an analysis that combines flow, heat transfer and mixing. So, but this zone is quite complicated because you know you have solid, you have liquids as well. And the last zone is the metering zone, or is where the material is uh, totally melted in liquid. So, as such treatment combines the flow and heat transfer as well. So, before we do some technical analysis, it's important for us to somehow see here the um, the geometry of the screw extruder. And it's for us, the interest is we are able to define the flight of the screw, the screw diameter, the diameter of the barrel, as well as the, um, what do you call it? The pitch distance of the, the distance between the flight of the screw as the barrel as well. And then we also have some terms such as the helix angle. I think you can, uh, see where the helix angle is, and then the width of the flow channel. All of these dimensions are actually important for your design later. Okay, should we go to the next slide? Now, talking about extrusion, there are many diverse kinds of uh, screws that we can use depending on the applications. And the diverse nature of polymers as well can be extruded in a variety of operating conditions to create different types of screw commercially as depicted in his in this uh, presentation. So the polymers conveyed through the extruder ultimately passes through a die or mold and the ranges of pressure are given on these tables. So the table shows from low film to filament. You see the filament has really a high uh, temperature requirement because these are very small. So the smaller you, you extrude, the higher pressure it has to be uh, uh, is required, right? So the blow film are very thin, or the cast film are very thin, and there are sheets they're very wide, so pressure are not that big compared to the filament. Okay, uh, can we click it, uh, Dr. Hangara? I'm showing. So uh, after the feed, we go to the uh, plasticizing zone. 
So in the plasticizing zone, as what I mentioned, it is a combination of the solid and liquid because they are transitioning to a hot melt or to, to the liquid melt of your polymer. So in this section, there are two kinds of mechanisms that can happen. You know, when the solid, uh, when the solid particles uh, 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 are, 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 what do you call it, in contact with your screw, and then your screw has a uh, different kinds of temperature. Like if the screw is above the melting temperature of your solid pellets, then this film, the solid bed, is actually in contact with the liquid. Also, all throughout the contacts here in Y and X are in liquid, you know. But if the screw temperature is below the melting temperature of your solid, uh, uh, the X and Y contact here are actually in solid form. So these are some of the complications that you have to consider during the design of your of your uh, of extruder in the metering zone, in the, not metering zone, in the uh, plasticating zone. Okay, should we go to the next slide? <clears throat> okay, so when the polymer is finally at melt, we're now in the metering zone. Uh, its flow can be treated as hydrodynamic analysis, like any liquid that flows. So this is less complicated to the uh, plasticating zone because they're all in the same phase. And we can also assume it is isothermal and later on adiabatic. So the principal flows involved here is the flow. Um, it's the interaction between like the drag flow, we have the pressure flow and the leakage flow. So the drag flow is where the melt is dragged forward in the screw channel by the action of the screw. So I think it's quite logical that there is a drag flow in there. So the pressure flow is actually the result of the backward flow uh, because of the pressure difference between the high pressure die and then the feed zone. So there is a difference in this pressure. So it's a backward pressure that goes against the uh, drag flow. Leakage flow, again, is the leakage in between the, the distance of your barrel and the flight uh, distance on top. So, but usually uh, as far as my equation is concerned on the right side, in, in terms of getting the heat uh, transfer total, we take out the leakage flow. Uh, so it is an ideal situation, basically, that uh, uh, we only consider the drag and the pressure flow so that the total heat shown is in this equation, the drag and the pressure uh, heat. The flows are complicated functions at the extruder geometry. So as a, there is a semi-empirical approach used in this equation given here where we have a, can I move it? Uh, FD and FP, uh, FD and FP are actually, um, what do you call it, uh, factors from the shape of the extruders. And each extruder has a different FB and FD right here, values uh, presented for, for the uh, metering section. Now, okay, can we go to, I just click it, okay. So let's consider some design of the extruders uh, so the proper design of an extruder requires that all the three sections should be properly matched, right? Like you can't have a feed section that is quite higher than the, your metering section. So because you can have, you, you will, uh, it might drag your, uh, your, it might plug the die itself. If the die, if the die, uh, if the feed section uh, capacity is higher, than your metering section. That means they have to be matched. And because of this matching, you have uh, different scenarios on the length of your, of, your, uh, uh, of your extruder. So the scenario A is where the melting capacity, the melting capacity is actually a, no, actually melting is uh, so much higher than the metering section. So A is uh, the transition or the plasticating section is higher than the metering section. So this is the A, A, A scenario. The B scenario is matched, wherein it is to be considered to be optimum operation. And then the C scenario is well, the melting uh, capacity or the transition capacity is uh, very low than the metering section. So uh, maybe one of the design uh, specification is to get how much is the, the minimum diameter of your screw. And then here there's a relationship between the horsepower required versus the volume of the extrudate. So and then HP requires the power, which is actually a function of your temperature of your, 
uh, that is, wait a minute, T sub E is the extra day temperature and T sub F is the feed temperature. Okay, and then HP is the horsepower that you get from this equation. Then uh, you get the volume as well. And then you then get the minimum uh, screw diameter that you need to get. What about the length? So there's a relationship between the length and the diameter ratio. So getting the length, uh, eventually you get the, the diameter. Getting the diameter, you can eventually get the diameter, the length of these. Uh, so longer barrels, so longer barrels are actually favored because they provide proper mixing, for example, of the extra date, as well as the uniformity of higher rates. But again, it is a compromise on the space as well as the cost. So yeah, should we go to the next slide? Now, these are some of the process parameters that we should consider in um, designing our extruders. So melting temperature, uh, for this, it is important to understand the melting characteristic of the plastic as well. So a lot of these plastics are thermoplastic, and we have to know what is the melting temperature of these plastics so that uh, we will be able to have the design of the heating elements on the heating side of the barrel. And then in such a way to generate a specific temperature to melt the plastic material. If there's not enough melting, the feed through the rotating screw can be problematic, especially on getting the desired viscosity and which can also result to some unmelted uh, portion of the final product. And then there is letter B on the screw speed. Uh, okay. So again, we have to determine the optimal speed uh, so that we can get to the required quality of the product. Too slow or too fast can affect the related quality of the product. And it's the same with other parameters such as the type of the dye, that's letter C, and also letter D, finally, the cooling medium. So the extrusion pressure, again, there was a table for this. It depends also on the product and the type of, of, of extrusion that you want to do. Okay. Okay. We will not be talking about the cooling medium later. So because a lot of these uh, cooling uh, can be air cool or liquid pool. Now let's talk about how, what are the types of extrusions and its applications in the industry. So this one is called, uh, can you click one more? Okay, this is called a sheet film extrusion. So the molten plastic here from the extruder um, is extruded through a flat die actually here. Uh, the cooling rolls are used to determine the thickness. So these are the rolls, right? So in between these rolls is a distance that determines the thickness of the sheet or films and its surface uh, texture or finish as well. So some rolls can be rough or smooth, then you get uh, that kind of sheet in the product. Thus the surface rolls dictate the thickness and its texture. The thickness of the sheet can be obtained in the range of 0.2 to 15 millimeters. And the, the thick flat sheet or film of plastic material can also be made. So generally, uh, a lot of polystyrene plastics is used as raw materials in the sheet extrusion process. Okay, the next one, uh, one more click. It's called the blow film extrusion. So by the word itself, there must be blowing here. And uh, the die here is vertically uh, arranged. So this is the die. Or oh, this is the, uh, the end of the extrusion process the bottom, so the die is uh, above the extruder. Uh, with a circular profile in the molten plastic is pulled upward for around, it can go to from four meters to 20 meters from the die by a pair of nip rollers. So actually there is a nip rollers here on top of the, uh, of the blown material or sometimes you call it pinch roller because you pinch them together. They are also used to press two or more sheets together to form a laminated product. So the compressed air used to inflate the tube around the die. So actually there is an air supply here, which is uh, uh, supplied by a compressor or the compressed air. So in the center of the die is an airlet, air inlet from which compressed air can be forced into the center of the circular profile and hence the tube, you create a tube creating a bubble, for example. 
and then the extruder circular cross section may be increased from two to three times of the, uh, uh, the diameter of the die. So some of the examples that you can uh, uh, get from the groceries are the packaging, which is a, actually a, a result of the blow film extruders. Okay. The next one is called, uh, one more click, jacketing extrusion. So from the word itself, you're jacketing something. And in this case, mostly are wires. So on the right and most side, you can see an example of the wires, wherein there is also jacketing or coating, or sometimes we call it extrusion uh, coating or jacketing extrusion, which involves coating of wires. Now the green color here represents the uh, molten plastic from the, from the extruder. And, um, and the role of wire is in the middle of this uh, uh, schematic diagram. So there are two kinds here. So what's the difference of the jacketing coating and the pressure coating? So sometimes we require for the molten plastic to adhere into the, uh, into the wire, but sometimes they don't, so it depends. If you just want jacketing coating, you don't need pressure, or you don't need adhesion of the molten plastic into the wire. But if you want a adhesion of the wire, of the molten plastic to the wire, then you have more pressure in it, or you, you tend to apply more pressure in it. So there should be an intimate, for the pressure coating, there is an intimate uh, uh, adhesion between the molten plastic and your wire. And it also needs longer uh, adhesion uh, space uh, compared to the um, jacketing coating itself. Okay. Uh, the, the, the other one is tubing extrusion. So this is where you make a lot of hollow sections or tubes in general, which are usually extruded by placing a mandrel. So a mandrel is here on your right side. So the mandrel is actually attached to the end of the uh, die. So uh, the molten plastic again is extruded through a die and hollow cross sections are formed like tubes through the mandrel. So tube, being with multiple holes can also be done using multiple mandrels as well. And this is used to make different types of hollow pipes. For example, uh, we can do what do you call it? PVC pipes in our water systems that is used through a, that has been manufactured through tubing extrusion. So uh, I think my last example is on the next slide. We call it co-extrusion. I think this is very self-explanatory where it, it requires uh, layers of extruders and then you put them in one uh, final product. So there's also what we call, um, uh, yeah, this is what we can also call it as a multiple co-extrusion layers where in the material is simultaneously uh, extruded. It could be different material types and it could be a lot of series, more than two uh, layers as well. It is used to apply one or more layers on top of a material to obtain a specific property, such as uh, properties wherein you want your outer layer to be uh, um, resistant to UV rays. You want your inner layer to be super hydrophobic, for example. So these types of properties that you want to, 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 to engineer in the future. And it also can also use many type of processes, such as you can also use like extruder A, uh, a blow film, and extruder B as an over jacketing or uh, tubing or sheet film extrusion. So it can be a, what do you call it, a combination of the different types of extrusion as well. So the thickness or the layer thickness is controlled by the speed and size of the individual extruders delivering materials. Okay. Uh, I think we're quite overwhelmed by the different type of extrusions. So here I'd like to point out some of the advantages and the disadvantages. So maybe first, why do you need to make extrusion? Or uh, what's the advantage of extrusion? One, it, they say it's a low cost. Well, it depends on the type of extrusion, right? But generally, it can be lower in terms of the uh, efficiency and the process-wise, because this one is how do you call it? It's semi, it, it's continuous process, you know, well, compared to a batch, uh, you have to end it for a certain time and then you have to begin it again. So it might, uh, 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 it might, it, it will cost more 
how I say, more money to run it again in a day for how many batches, but for continuous process, the extrusion process has a low cost relative to the other processes because of the efficiency as well of the process. And then the leftover materials, for example, is normally discarded uh, as waste in other processes can be used or reused in extrusion. Just put it back to the feed, right? And another one is flexibility. So extrusion molding provides considerable flexibility in manufacturing products with a consistent cross section. And um, so there are a variety of roller dies which can be used for different shapes of your products or to alter the different shapes of the extruded plastic to fit certain requirements. And again, continuous operation is an advantage of this type of polymer processing because uh, it saves uh, cost, energy, and the time for the whole operation to operate. And there's also high production volume, is what I've mentioned in my first slide. It is a high uh, production volume processing, and the um, product output uh, of extrusion is observed to possess properties that suggest good mixing um, because of its uh, of its nature to mix well in inside the barrel. And it can produce a higher amount of products compared to, of course, batch processes. Uh, another one is the various type of materials that can be used. So it can be used in different products requiring different materials as well, or different composite products for uh, different materials and properties. But on the consequence side, um, the disadvantage side, uh, can you click one more, Dr. Hangara? Yeah. So, yeah, there is also a, a, a consequence on getting size variations of your uh, products. When the hot plastic exceeds the extruder, it, it frequently expands. So predicting the exact degree of expansion remains problematic as it arises from the different factors in the process. And then there is product uh, uh, variations due to the heat use an unpredictable expansion is expected. Therefore, the manufacturers accept such significant level of deviation compared to the original products. And then initial cost setup is really big because the equipment itself is big and it requires a lot of space as well. And it says a high compressive force required. Um, I think this can be emphasized in cold extrusion wherein you don't need heat to extrude your plastic, but then the force required for extrusion is really high compared or relatively high compared to the heated extrusion. And then of course your material dye will wear as well. And I think one of the um, disadvantages here is like, there might be slight product variations that is delivered in the product stream. Um, so I think that actually concludes my presentation on the basics of extrusion. And I'd like to conclude uh, on my next slide that in this lecture, I was able to uh, give you some basic steps or the zones of extrusions, involved in extrusions, the critical design parameters, the types and applications of extrusions that you might be interested in the future. Thank you and hope uh, you'll have a great weekend. So yeah, I'm open to questions right now. Okay, that's an extra slide actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is anyone doing a study on extrusion or plastic processing? No, oh, actually in, in uh, our department, uh, one of our lecture, is doing with polymer, but this is not like uh, synthetic polymer, but this is like more like um, biopolymers and yeah. bioplastic and something like that. Yeah. yeah, I think there is now a transition to that kind of material, especially on, you know, responding to the sustainability uh, <laughs> yeah. index and pressures around the world. We are actually, we need to such kind, but I don't know if, there has been bioplastic that has been extruded. <laughs> no, it's still in the development Very stage. Early stage, right? So industry-wise, not such a thing. And you know that uh, the
the turn, uh, I mean, the situation is that if everything is, if we talk about uh, everything about uh, sustainability, usually people is very interested, even though in the real setting, maybe it doesn't work at all. I agree. But uh, of course, we still have to pursue, we have to encourage such a uh, effort. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, hopefully yeah. we can achieve real sustainability. Uh. Uh, I think there's a question from uh, Camille uh, at Chris Iskan on the biodegradable plastic extruder. So as far as I'm concerned, I've never had experience on the extruding bioplastics yet. Uh, you know, bioplastics can be uh, synthesized like microbial, fungal, and also lab, lab scale, uh, lab scale uh, synthesis, which I am also doing that, but never had <laughs> uh, extrusion yet because extrusion is more industrial. So, and we are not yet in that stage as what Dr. Hangar was telling us. So I don't think it will be sooner <laughs> to extrude bioplastic. Have you tried this Dr. Hangara, extruding bioplastic? <laughs> Uh, because if we work with uh, bioplastics, the problem is uh, we, we have many problems. So one of the problems is the stability of these materials. Yes, thermal stability and mechanical stability also. Um, they are a lot of these properties. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we have a project for bioplastic from Kaitosan. This uh, one of my... Uh, uh, groups so they what they do is extract it from chitin or from shrimp waste actually and then our final product is actually a a, a package for uh snacks chips and yeah we are, same <laughs> yeah so we are in contact with a manufacturer here in the philippines so um, but it's still there's a lot of limitations using bioplastics for packaging food for example because what we can produce are kytosan based and these are kytosan based can be actually uh, diluted when it's in, in water, for example, for a long time. So there's a limitation for this. So I don't know what's the future, but the way we, 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 we make the, the, the packing is through solvent casting. Uh -huh. So we have a cast, we pour, the, we pour our liquid already in liquid, and then we form the casts itself, and then two casts, and then two kind of two kind two cast, uh, two kind material inner and outer layer, and then we put them together, and then another one for the the other layer. So no extrusion yet. <laughs> so in the state, I mean, uh, yeah, if we see in the literature, um, many people, so many people nowadays are. Are doing about bioplastic, I believe, especially in the uh, tropical countries like Brazil and I saw Mexico. I saw some 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 of the groups working with bioplastic. And yeah, if if we saw the paper, sometimes if we review this paper, uh, very promising, very promising. And but when uh, I also have some colleague who work in industry and. Uh, the industrial uh, sites, uh, they are always. Uh, yeah, uh, feel not that confidence uh, of applying this technology. But yeah, uh, I believe that someday maybe we can find the raw material which is suitable for this this large large uh, uh, the the large scale production. Uh, what what do you think? Is this possible in the next, let's say, twenty years or uh, uh, twenty five years? Dr. Hangara, they already are making large scale uh, bioplastics. In fact, they are uh, uh, marketing them, but their products, are, their processing are not just extrusion. They have a different, I forgot the, I forgot the specific name, but they have uh, different uh, technology to do them with the use of these bioplastics in large scale. Maybe, yeah, we can have maybe one more lecture on just bioplastic uh, as a feed for industrial, but maybe we can have someone from Europe to, to, to teach us on that. And maybe I can invite someone. Uh, I have a, an EU uh, uh, connection because the EU and USC has a, we call it a, a, 
we had a series of green technologies and then the EU ASEAN webinar, they, 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 the main purpose is to uh, transfer their technologies to the ASEAN. So maybe we can, yeah, we can do that instead of course, introduction to this, uh, this well-known type of production of plastic. But then as you mentioned, we are transitioning to a different kind of economy this time using biodegradable plastics. So uh, to answer that question, yes, but in, in, in ASEAN, I'm not sure how long will it take us. <laughs> I see. Yeah, uh, because uh, as you know, our countries are, um, uh, our country have uh, quite a lot of uh, different raw material, which might be suitable for bioplastic. But uh, no, uh, my work is also uh, includes this this topic so uh, i'm searching the suitable raw material for for making bioplastic uh because maybe the the toughness or the stability is not that good but uh, it can be improved uh, for sure so uh hopefully <laughs> hopefully i can get something <laughs> something <Yeah. laughs> what well, uh, may i ask uh dr hangar what kind of alternative sources are you using this time no, this is not something like alternative, but I I have I use the uh, how to call in English. So yeah, maybe some of the children can answer. Uh, this is like a, um, water hyacinth or something like this. I, I forget ah, the name. Yeah, yeah, the one in funds. Yeah, yeah, something like okay. this. Okay, I see. Got got it. So in uh, University of San Carlos, we are developing number one is the fiber for an. Uh, Kitin or Kaikusan from shrimp waste because we have a, an industry here who is producing, um, who are actually exporting shrimp. Then they take the heads and the shells as waste that usually go to the landfill. So we're taking their waste and making plastic. Another one we have magay fiber. These are tropical plants that are uh, well, uh, that is well known in Cebu. And then we extract cellulose from them. But um, cellulose is, is it's a big, how do I say, uh, we have a big source of cellulose, but I'm not trying to do another study for making bioplastic from cellulose. I think um, one of my studies that I want to pursue is nanocellulose itself, which mm -hmm. actually uh, goes back to my uh, fiber spinning technology. You're making membrane, not membranes, but uh, making fibers out from nanocellulose using the, uh, the wet spinning. Yes, the wet spinning technology. Yes, what solution given, sir? Uh, if we're operating extrusion machine, what solutions are generally given, sir? Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, Rayatus, that's a very unique name, Rayatus. <laughs> Looks like a hero now. So, what are the problems for extrusion uh, problems? Okay. One of the problems, as far as I uh, as far as I can share, because I don't have industrial uh, I don't have an industrial uh, experience for uh, how do I say in extrusion uh, industries, but I can only share it from my uh, from my uh, friends who has been there. So one of their problems is uh, like leaking, although you know it's 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 typical uh, it's a typical. Uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, assumption that in our calculation, we don't have leaking problems. But one of the problems that I have interviewed from my, uh, from my friends is uh, the leaking and then the product variations that they can use. Uh, they can only get it from, out, from getting the product itself. So what they do is uh, they do a lot of trial runs because in the, in the um, what do you call it, in their uh, industry, they have a quality check so in the quality check, they try to get the uh, process parameters that they want in the extrusion machine. And then they try to find out the product itself, the variation of the product itself. So one, as far as I know, one of the problems that they get is the product variations that they get from the, after the extrusion machine. And then they go back to, 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 to solving the problem through the parameters. So the parameters can be the, the temperature, the screw speed, the, maybe the type of the die itself. So if you want to have more experience, I think uh, on the extrusion, it's better to have a, what do you call it? A uh, on-the-job training in a polymer, uh, polymer machine. 
So maybe I would say that I don't have experience in a polymer technology or a polymer processing technology. So that limits my answer to that. Thank you. Actually, I have a question. So let's say um, it's possible using your machine to, to make, uh, of course, possible maybe a uh, membrane, mem uh, membrane from, is 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 uh is possible to to make membrane from from your machine your nanofiber machine? Yes, you mean the solution blow spinning machine? Yes, so the yeah. spinning machine, and then, uh, for example, if I want to put uh catalytic particle there on the membrane, is also possible? Like yes, I'm thinking about the photocatalytic uh, membrane. Is possible? Yeah, definitely. So, so what we do, Dr. Hangara, is you know making the making the nanofibers is from the polymer melt, right? So yes, in the no. polymer melt, we put the catalyst there, like the titanium dioxide powder. We mix them well with oh, okay, I okay. use PVP, poly yeah, pyrrolein. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we mix it well, and then we uh, force the liquid into the co extruder, and yeah, feed it, and then air pressure comes in. It, what comes out a nanofiber on the uh, we have a substrate where you collect the nanofibers and that becomes your membrane. Okay, okay. Because recently we 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 successfully make uh, like uh, titanium dioxide, but uh, it has very high surface area up to four hundred meter square per gram, and this is in the metal oxide class. This is uh, quite very high even. So, but uh, I don't know how to make like in nanofiber. So I'm thinking. Uh, maybe it's better to make a membrane and then we put this nanoparticle uh, to yes. see. Yeah. Maybe you can tell me what kind of membrane you want. I'll try to make it in the lab and send it to you. Ah, I see. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, let me think. <laughs> Thank you very much. So what we did, we, uh, we did a membrane using a titanium dioxide in PVP or polyvinylidine Pyrrolidon. So the PVP nanofiber is actually the matrix of, yes, the, the, matrix. Uh -huh. yeah, of the tiny titanium dioxide. So it's easy oh, okay, actually okay. to, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, it's easy to recover your membrane, yeah, yeah, yes. membrane itself rather than the solids. Actually, the titanium dioxide sometimes dissolves in your... like. Yeah, example, this is the problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This way it's not can... expensive, right? Sorry? It's not expensive, the titanium no, no. dioxide. Very cheap. <laughs> yeah, very cheap. This why it's quite promising. Uh, but uh, for the commercial titanium dioxide, it's not so good in some of the, the surface area because usually less than 100 meters square per gram. Yes, I agree. Okay, any other question, please? We have a lot more students today, like 104 minus us. So are these all the students really? <laughs> or is maybe, it well, I don't know, maybe some of the students other than this class join, maybe around 10 or 20 students, I guess. Ah, okay. So you really have a big uh, student population in chemical engineering. Uh, yeah, compared to some of the universities, Yes, but compared to like uh, some of the universities, it's also not so, 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 so many. I want to ask if you have polymer processing industries near your town? Uh, probably, I believe yes, but not so near, but uh, in the, because in our province here, we have the second largest uh, city in Indonesia, which is Rabaya, and I, I believe that some of the polymer industry are located there, but I'm not, let, let me check. First. Oh, okay. Because um, we have one here actually. Uh, in Cebu, there are, uh, I know two here mm -hmm. that does uh, polymer processing and also make, just making the plastic uh, packaging. And then of course the consumer ends in different industries, but making the plastic themselves, we have, I know two of them. 
So that's why I am taking this subject as an elective this time, polymer processing technology. And it's quite also new to our uh, university. So that's why uh, this is still a, not experimental, but uh, the first <laughs> uh, elective course on polymer processing in our university. Although I think the polymer polymerization topics are also covered in chemistry. Yes. Right? So our, the focus more on the polymer processing is basically on the design factors in chemical engineering. So, and it would be better if we have an industrial, I think, uh, speaker. Like, I don't think I am credible enough to speak about the industrial applications because I don't have an industrial application in polymer processing. But uh, maybe in our next um, in our next series of lectures, maybe next year, I can invite someone from the industry to talk more on the industrial applications. While I think us can do more into the uh, design factors in, mm -hmm. in chemical engineering. So that's my maybe next um, suggestion. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we actually uh, regularly invite uh, uh, some expert from industry, but uh, since our um, study program focus is actually on the bio-based chemicals and functional ah. foods, and not, not, not polymers, that's why uh, we are focus, focusing on this, this one. Yeah. <clears throat> Here, uh, we do not uh, focus on like catalyst, particle, polymer, or something like this, but uh, we like uh, we usually love uh, love. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, we usually focus on the uh, something about the nature, natural products, functional yeah. foods. Yeah. I see. But uh, yeah, for polymer processing technology course, I think somehow the students. I suggest that they should have a somehow a you know basic overview of the traditional ones, right? Like extrusion. Uh, topics as well as the traditional spinning topics that I have uh, mentioned from my previous lecture. Because, mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, what you mentioned, we are trying to uh, answer the call of what is also uh, significant these days. But in uh, San Carlos, uh, the research about polymer technology also uh, in your focus or? Uh, actually, no. Uh, uh, as, far as, I, as far as I'm concerned, as a new faculty, we also have bio uh, uh, use of. Uh, wait a minute. We have projects using mm, different oils for making fatty acids, such mm -hmm. as biodiesel. Mm -hmm. Biodiesel from alternative sources. It can be waste or uh, unused. Um, not so much used type of feedstock for making biodiesel because in my country we are uh, driven to produce more biodiesel. Oh. So that's one of the uh, that's one of the uh, universities or the departments uh, focus on projects this time for research. And then we also have environmental uh, technologies, but more on the wastewater treatment. Mm -hmm. all kinds of projects like that and then i started my own group in 2019 on sustainable materials or new materials from uh biodegradable source or like um i would say alternative sources that are green and yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> so, so plastic is not polymer plastics um mm -hmm. not much no not in this type of of, of uh, discussion that we're having no but uh, we have, as well, I mentioned, we have projects that are, uh, that are uh, into making packaging, like bioplastic packaging for food industries. So, so uh, one last question maybe. So uh, from your point of view, uh, what is the most promising topics in chemical engineering in the context of Philippines? Uh, of course, in the context of Indonesia also, right? Because we are uh, pretty similar. So uh, like, this is like, a, Biomass based uh, research, or because you know that in chem normally in chemical engineering department, we have a large uh, uh, kind of topic from particle technology to uh, something like biochemical engineering and so on. So, on. so but now um, here we focus only on biomass based 
uh, reasons. So, actually, in in the context of Philippines, what what do you think? What is the most promising uh, research topic? Uh, yeah. I share the same sentiment with you on the use of <laughs> biomass base. In fact, a lot of our uh, students are doing this type of projects these days, and I cannot blame them because you know we are triggered with the needs of the country. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I I share the same sentiments in the biomass biomass uh, applications of the different types for plastics mm -hmm. industries. Um, but to be honest, um, uh, there is always a big gap <laughs> between the industries and the academic research. So um, it's I don't know if it's the same with you because here it's it's the, it's it's what's happening. You know, most of the industries use a lot of synthetic. One, right nowadays, synthetic plastic. They never use those biomass uh, waste, uh, biomass uh, feedstock uh, for plastics yet, because they are not. Well, actually, they can, but uh, there must be some sort of uh, higher, bigger collaboration between the academic and the industries. So that's what's all. I'm also pushing, pushing in research because research is useless when it's not applied in the future. Yeah, we have to make more, I mean, uh, more effective communication between these two sides so that we, we can understand what's, what do you need? What is your uh, important thing that we can meet? Something like this, I, I guess. So may, okay. I ask, yeah. like, may I ask a question? Yeah, in, yeah. in your country, yeah. when you propose a project with the government fund, do you, is it required for you to have a collaboration with the industries? Most of the cases are not, no need, no need to, yeah. But some of the big project, we have to, let's say, we have to uh, take some, some, some person from industry, from industry outside, yeah, from industry. Okay. In most of the cases, no, no need. Mm. Yeah, that's why uh, mm, sometimes we are not so, what to say, not so confident whether our technology is applicable to the setting or not. <laughs> I see. Okay. Same here, but because we have two kinds of projects, like it can be basic research or applied yeah, yeah. research. So applied all research. of the applied research, you have to have a connection with the industries. But basic research is not a requirement. Okay, uh, is there any question? So, so I think uh, because of our uh, limitation and um, of course I apologize, apologize for some of the conveniences that we face, uh, but I believe that uh, the original information can be effectively transferred to you guys so that you can learn because this, uh, this material is shared in YouTube so you can uh, see again, you can extract the information uh, from the Dr. Uh, Noel. And then uh, for the final examination, uh, we will take some of the information um, from these two presentations so that you have to learn to pass the final examination. Oh. Uh, again, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll send the first uh, material because I don't think I sent it to you, right? Oh, I'll yeah. send the first one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. From our side, uh, we thank you very much, and we hope that this uh, initiation, this collaboration in the joint teaching, can uh, trigger more ac academic collaboration between uh, two sides. If you have any comment, Dr. Noel, please uh, deliver to us. But uh, yeah, we we are very happy to receive your comment or any anything from your side. <laughs> Okay, if you have, please, to us. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, did you say comment? Yeah, <laughs> if you have any comment, but if no, it's no problem at all. So. Okay, but I'm, I'm, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity for the collaboration. And I hope we can continue this and uh, make it better, maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah of course. <laughs> yeah, so. 
yeah, so thank you. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward for more uh, lecture collaborations this time because it is very effective for us to exchange ideas and knowledge as well as future project collaborations as well. Okay, Dr. Nolan, again, thank you very much. And see you.